un aplauso para Mark Atkin. Bienvenido. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I decided to call this talk What Happened to the Digital Revolution because I know what's going to happen. At the end of these two days, you're going to go home and you're going to think about everything. Uh, you'll be totally inspired, but when you boil it all down, you're sort of going to start asking yourselves a few questions, such as, aren't interactive projects really actually quite niche? You know, where is the blockbuster? Um, and is it, isn't it quite hard to fund multi-platform projects? Where do we go from here? Um, where is that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow? And where is this bright future that we've all been promised? Isn't it the case that we just, over the course of these two days, just drunk a little bit too much of the transmedia Kool-Aid? And that all of the people you've heard talking are a bit like the snake oil salesman of old who promised um, this, this kind of snake oil medicine is going to cure absolutely everything. Or like cult leaders, or, or like the guy who actually sold the monorail to Springfield in Simpsons. <laughs> He's that guy. <laughs> Isn't it all actually just a load of hype? Uh, what we call in English a flash in the pan, something that creates an explosion and light and lots of smoke, but actually nothing really actually happens. Well, if it is hype, um, we can actually analyze hype. So these people, Gartner, um, it's, it's the world's leading information technology research and advisory company, have analyzed hype, and, and it tends to fall into this kind of a pattern. Uh, any kind of a disruptive technology gets people super excited for a while, and then afterwards they analyze it a bit, and they think, well, it wasn't really as good as all that, was it? And you come into this trough of disillusionment. And then you work out what it's really good at, and then you start getting more sensible about it and applying it appropriately. Um, and what I'm going to argue today is that we're sort of probably around here on the slope of enlightenment in terms of multi-platform. There's still quite a lot of work to do, but we're almost getting to this wonderful plateau of productivity. But in order to do that, I'm going to talk about what makes us happy. And in order to do that, I'm going to start right at the birth of broadcasting, when radio was first invented. Um, I'm going to start in about 1910, and I'm going to go all the way up to 2020. So here we are. Radio's just been invented. The BBC is the first public broadcaster. And people are gathered around the radio um, as a kind of a family unit, family and friends together. And they're all looking at the radio, the storytelling hearth in the corner of the room even though there's nothing actually to look at. It's not moving or anything like that. But this is how the people who invented radio thought that it was going to be used, right? And in actual fact, eventually, um, they realized radio has become an ambient medium, and it's something that you listen to instead while you're doing the housework, or when you're doing your homework, or when you're driving to work, or when you're actually at work. Then along comes television. And when tele television was first invented, people thought it was going to be used like this. It's exactly like that picture of the radio. It's the storytelling hearth in the corner of the room. The whole family are gathered around it, giving it their undivided attention. But what we know now is that television itself is possibly becoming an ambient medium as well. And this is the reality of how it's now consumed. Um, and this kind of a picture kind of alarms us as content creators, because when you <laughs> realize that there's only one person who's actually really looking at the main screen, and that kind of scares us. But what's happened in the evolution of television is we've gone from when television was a social event through somewhat dark days in the 80s and 90s when VHS was invented and then multi-channeling, when people used to literally watch different television screens in different parts of the room and the family was all split up. And it was an isolated act to watch television. And now, thankfully, we've moved through that into an era of social television. And a similar kind of an evolution has happened in news as well. It used to be everybody was read to from the same broadsheet by the town crier in the middle of the marketplace. And then we moved to um, an era where we would get one limited worldview coming through our door that was probably quite different from the person next door. And now we've moved beyond that. 
uh, to an era where we aggregate multiple news sources, um, and uh, most of them are social. So we, we, we aggregate our news now through Facebook and Twitter um, and through different kinds of news feeds and some of them in newspapers, but most of them are actually socially enabled. You can actually take that story, comment about it directly, and share it. So David Brooks um, wrote in this book, The Social Anim Animal, joining a club that meets once a month produces the same happiness game as doubling your income. I mean, he's American, so he sort of equates happiness with, with, uh, with money. But anyway, we know where he's going with that. Um, it's all about the number of people you associate with and how intimately you associate with them. And that kind of stuck with me. I, I really thought about that quite a lot. And then I was starting to sort of think, well, how does that, um, what does that mean about social networks? And then I started to study it a bit, and I came across this article by Christakis and Fowler in the British Medical Journal. Now, if something's in the British Medical Journal, it's true, because it's about people's health and well-being, and it doesn't get there unless it's being uh, absolutely scrutinized by a number of different health experts before it gets published. So what they said was, a person's happiness is related to the happiness of their friends, their friends' friends, and their friends' friends' friends. That is, to people well beyond their social horizon. So what that means is that your happiness and my happiness is somewhat reliant on people we don't even know. That's our friends, friends, friends. And then they go on to say, we found that happy people tend to be located in the center of their social networks and to be located in large clusters of other happy people. And we found that each additional happy, fr happy friend increases a person's probability of being happy by about 9%. Now, I thought that was actually quite amazing. So then I started wondering, is this really going to be true with online social networks as well? And so one of these guys, Chris Dakis, continued his study by looking at Facebook. And what he found that um, people who post a picture of him or herself smiling on Facebook, they're more likely to have online friends who are all also smiling in their profile pictures. So it seems to be true that 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 is being replicated through online social networks as well. And in a, an unrelated study uh, from the University of Indiana, uh, these guys studied Twitter, and they're looking at happiness in Twitter. And what they found is that the general happiness or subjective well-being of Twitter users is assortative across the Twitter social network. So what, they really, so what that means is that happy people in the Twitterverse, in the universe of Twitty, Twitter users, seek out and follow other happy people. And we nat naturally and instinctively do that because it contributes to our own happiness. It's a sort of a natural process that we go through. We have this wonderful expression in English, that sort of birds of a feather flock together. And this seems to be what's happening um, over there in, in the world of Twitter. So the internet facilitates disparate groups to converse in real time. And what we're looking at here isn't necessarily quite as scary as it might seem at first sight, because actually what these people are engaged in is highly, highly, highly socialized activity. And um, if you play your cards right, you can sort of coordinate that, and you can be in charge of it, and, and really aggregate those conversations and make them about that content that's on the main screen there, if you were responsible for that. But there's something else that they're doing at the same time. I think Damian yesterday sort of had this wonderful image of this massive wave. It was like the media wave. Uh, this is how we experience media, though. In fact, it's almost sometimes like a tsunami that's about to engulf us. So this was this, in this um, piece of research that was done uh, in 2011, people even back then felt that year on year, uh, the amount of information coming their, their way was doubling. And uh, most people, like almost three quarters of people, described their data stream as a roaring river, a flood, or a massive tidal wave, which has led to this sort of rather uniquely 21st century um, <laughs> problem called FOMO, fear of missing out. What those people are doing through 
online social networks is actually trying to manage that flood. And they're taking this complicated digital world that's been created, and they're recreating it in their own form for today's socialized, digitized human being. And they do that naturally in order to sort of deal with this tidal wave. They're also doing it because they know instinctively that it contributes to their own happiness. So audiences like to interact. It's kind of what makes us human, and it makes us happy. But we also humanize our environments as well. So town planners call these kind of pathways that people make that, they, that weren't designed, where people decide, well, why don't I want to go in that straight line when I could go over there? Town planners call those desire lines. I love that expression. So <laughs> look at that stupid, complicated <laughs> thing over there. Like, they've created a really impossible way that is against human nature to walk. You know? and, and why would you walk all the way around there? Humans don't walk in straight lines. When you get to take a shortcut, of course they're going to do that. And this is the difference between design, you know, the design that's being created for us, and what pathways that we create are desire lines, and that's the user experience. And in media terms today, these kind of rigid pathways um, that have been designed are sort of like the traditional distribution methods of films that say a film is going to be out in the cine cinemas before it's on television, before it's on DVD, before it goes online, territory by territory. Those rigid pathways are also television schedules that say that at 9 o'clock on a Friday, I want to watch comedy, at 7.30 on a Tuesday, I want to watch a documentary. I mean, in actual fact, um, if you can actually take a shortcut through that, of course, it's natural human behavior to do that. So if I take this pathway instead, what's the response going to be? Am I just going to get prosecuted for that? So we call this tendency that old media has, or traditional entrenched media interests have, of taking all the content that they've currently got and trying to just cram it all onto um, any new platform that emerges. It's literally called cramming. Um, and the idea is, is, just can, is, is this new medium just another vehicle uh, for the content that I've already created, uh, whether it fits or not, whether it's appropriate or not? And, and quite often, that's not the most creative response that people have. And it's what Marshall McLuhan called back in the 1960s, um, marching backwards into the future. He said, we look at the future through the rear view mirror. We march backwards into the future which I think is very true. And what we need to understand instead, that we're in this middle of a shift from networks that are built about around distribution to ecosystems built around circulation. So you need to sort of think, how can I get the media that I've just created and allow it to circulate through this ecosystem so that people could discover it and share it? There was a little bit of talk yesterday about what the definition of transmedia is. Um, Wikipedia describes it as the technique of telling a single story or story experience across multiple platforms. That's, that's very true. I prefer this definition from this company called, called Campfire came up with. You know, Campfire create amazing kind of multi-platform experiences around big entertainment uh, uh, properties like uh, Game of Thrones, for instance. Um, and originally, these people made the Blair Witch Project. It was probably the first kind of multi-platform film. But they say transmedia storytelling is a way to tell a story that's closer to how we experience the real world. Now, I really do like that definition. But increasingly, this is the way we, ex we um, experience the world and make sense of it. These are just British statistics. So this is just the use, usage in the UK, but each month, 288 uh, million uses of Twitter, 300 million uses of Instagram, 890 million uses of Facebook. The average British person logs into Facebook 14 times a day. Um, and primarily, it's on the mobile phone. 80% of this is, uh, of, of Twitter is via mobile. 50% of YouTube via mobile. 
Uh, this is from The Guardian last week. The latest uh, statistics on how people access the internet shows that now the majority of people are accessing the internet via their mobile phones. And, uh, and that proportion of the public increases um, the, the younger they are. So for 18 to 24s, it's 50%. And this means that people are using laptops less and less. And mobile is now the primary way to access the internet. So this is going to be the primary way that people have of actually interacting with any kind of media. It's mobile first. So when it comes to sort of designing transmedia experiences, what we really sort of need to be engaged with is, is designing those desire lines, those, those human pathways that we know people want to take uh, for our socialized, digitized human beings, which was, I think, what um, Liz was talking about yesterday, and sort of talking about looking at, at behaviors of, of the users and designing experiences around those. Now, audiences expect to interact. I think one, one of the most uh, uh, disruptive uh, gadgets sort of created, obviously, was, was the iPhone. Um, and what changed everything there was the fact that you interact by touching the screen. That touch screen thing um, it was absolutely revolutionary. And I think you've probably all seen that kind of a thing where a toddler goes up to the TV and they try to interact with it by touching it. Um, and that's because, really, the moment you touch a screen these days and nothing happens, you're sort of, it's starting to feel a bit irrelevant. Now, here are some statistics from the BBC. The BBC tends to be quite conservative, and it tends to have a sort of a slightly older audience. And they've, um, this was a couple of years ago now, uh, they started analysing their audience, and they found that um, less than a quarter of their audience wants a passive experience. Only 23% of that kind of sit-back, lean-back audience, whereas more than three-quarters of their audience expect to interact with the content that they're creating. So if you're not creating that kind of a content, you're alienating a massive potential of audience, like more than 75% of the available audience expects that kind of interaction now. And I think this is kind of interesting as well. Um, a couple, of years ago, a couple of years ago, 2013, uh, was when apps overtook Hollywood. And this is just on, the, on iTunes. So these are, this is stuff that's come from Apple. So this is pure, only on iTunes. So obviously it's much, much bigger than that. But they actually overtook Hollywood Billings selling apps. And I think that sort of tells us that, that media convergence is probably here. That that device now that you interact by touching that's constantly connected to the internet which is our primary source of, of now um, relating to the, to the wider world outside. Um, media is, is driving media to become convergent. So technology has uh, transformed how stories are told. But storytelling is always at a project's heart. And this is what we were trying to drill into at those pitches this morning. And what was, what was often quite missing from those pitches, that all that anybody who's creating media wants to do is sort of change how people, um, uh, change them emotionally and sort of intellectually by appealing to them through storytelling. And technology has changed how we interact with the stories. So everything's becoming interactive, everything. So this is just the web page of a fairly normal program that's on Channel 4 called Made in Chelsea, which is a constructed reality TV series about the lives of beautiful people living in a posh suburb of London. And the only reason I show this, because it's really not very good, it's really not that interesting, is just how much additional stuff there is online. So obviously this is, this is the web page here, and it follows here, and there's, like, there's tons and tons and tons and tons of additional content. Um, there's, there's extra video, uh, you can watch all the back um, for, former editions of the program, uh, there's the Twitter feed. Um, you can look at, you can find out what music was played in the series. There's lots of kind of quotes that you can share, additional short material, um, exclusive web-only content, quizzes. It goes on. Uh, they've put all the trailers together. There's links into Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. There's a fitness video. You can buy the soundtrack. More exclusive video. There's a book. 
there's games, there's Spotify playlists, it goes on and on and on. Okay, so that's a lot of stuff, right? And um, <laughs> I suppose a few years ago, this would be seen as like, an extremely complex, difficult, expensive, massively transmedia experience that was extremely hard to do. And now it's just normal. It's really easy to do this stuff and it just whack it onto the website. The good thing about it is that, so the people who are commissioned to make the TV are now being also commissioned to do all this additional content. It just creates a huge amount of more work for independent producers. And they still do sort of the more um, creative kind of work as well, which when I was uh, um, a commissioner, I, a Channel 4 multi-platform commissioner, I commissioned this, and we just recently won a, a BAFTA, which is the main award in the UK for digital creativity for this, which, we're, which was a, a live link up to the International Space Station, uh, where we were, we were sort of chatting to the astronauts as they, the space station did an entire circumlocution of, of the world. Um, and uh, in here, there are also, there, there's games and kind of like a, an interactive web doc, um, and an ISS spotter, um, and lots of additional video as well. So more materials being commissioned. Um, Channel 4 is also commissioning web-only short film content. BBC is commissioning online material only. This increasingly is, is what um, newspaper feature articles look like, interactive documentaries that you'd find, for instance, on The Guardian. This one's a particularly good one that I would recommend to you thoroughly. Um, this is from the New York Times. And this is from Le Monde. These are all kind of interactive documentaries now uh, that newspapers are creating and commissioning. And now newspapers are also commissioning pure documentaries. So this is the... They've just appointed my former colleague Charlie Phillips from Sheffield Dockfest uh, to commission documentary which will live on the Guardian website. This is all media convergence. If you now look at the websites of a newspaper um, and of a, um, a radio station and a television station, they look quite the same because they all have video content, um, blogs, etc. Uh, book publishers are getting into publishing apps. Um, I love the work of this company called TouchPress, who create very dense um, apps around quite obscure stuff. So this is one app that's dedicated to one poem, The Wasteland, and it's absolutely fantastic. I've always found this poem quite hard to read, but this gives me a huge amount of pleasure because I can dip in and out of it and get to really understand it. Um, and it's quite expensive. It's about, uh, about 12 pounds, whereas most apps are probably about you know, two or three and that's deemed quite expensive. Uh, but, and this is, this is something that would never be commissioned by television because it's too intellectual, it's too high-end. But enough people love this kind of material that this company makes a big profit. Um, this is another one of their apps, which is absolutely beautifully designed. So it's one app dedicated to one piece of very difficult music. So they're making a living out of this by creating them themselves, making them available to the public. And it's not dumbing down, it's absolutely the opposite and they're a very profitable company. And it's never been so easy and cheap to self-publish. Uh, we just recently tried out a number of different platforms that have been created for independent producers to easily and cheaply make interactive stories. And anybody who's interested in, in experimenting with that should maybe sort of take a look at some of these. There's one's called Raconteur, another one's called Korsakov, this one's called Clint. This one's called Interlude Treehouse and Storigami. So we tried all of these out with a number of different filmmakers and the people who created these platforms. Um, and we, uh, we reported back at the Sheffield Blockfest. And if, you want to, if you're interested in finding out how all of these things work, you can read the blog um, that we created on our website, which is exolabs.co.uk. But these are incredibly good tools for, for people. They, they were created by filmmakers. Uh, working with technologists because those filmmakers wanted to tell a an interactive story and there was nothing available for them. So they had actually had to build it, and once they built it, they just made it available to everyone else. And I like this because it's a very effective project and it's quite moving. This was made for $50,000, um, um, and it's telling the stories of refugees in the largest refugee camp in the world, Dadaab. Um, and it's built on Tumblr, which doesn't look like it. And so most of the money that was, that, um, 
uh, of that 50,000 pounds went into design. But you can create something incredibly effective that, work, that resonates internationally for a very small amount of money. Now, there's something else I think that's probably important to understand as well, that the, today's connected, socialized audience um, is responding to authenticity over authority. So uh, what I mean by that is rather than sort of the authority is, is sort of the old uh, traditional media uh, way, uh, way of doing things where you're sort of told what to think and what to like. Um, and we're sort of fighting back a bit against that. Joe Pine wrote a book recently, Auth Authenticity, What Consumers Really Want. Um, and on his blog that goes with the book, um, he's sort of analyzed usage of the word authentic and authenticity and inauthentic. So you know how you can sort of take um, all of the literature that's been ingested into the Google brain. You can do a word search on it, and that's what he did. So between 1800 and the year 2000. And um, in 1800, they used to use those words quite a lot, authentic um, and uh, authenticity. And it sort of steadily decreased until you get to about here, um, where the trauma of the First World War made it come back into sort of fashion again a little bit. Now, it's been growing steadily and steadily ever since. And it sort of probably explains these kind of phenomena. So somebody had to do it, didn't they? Sort of put a cat up there. But maybe the reason why these things are so popular is because you can't fake that kind of an expression. So it's a kind of a, it's an authentic expression. That's why cats are so popular on the internet. And this search for authenticity is, is also why festivals are becoming so much more important as part of our lives than they used to be. Um, and it's also that, that quest for social activities as well. I think it explains why Airbnb uh, has become so popular um, and why they use this slogan, belong anywhere. It's, it's about the social, but it's also about that authentic experience that we're all craving. I think it might also explain this sort of Buenos Aires uh, phenomenon of, um, of kind of pop-up restaurants that happen in people's own homes. Uh, it's called was it Puertas Cerradas. Um, and it also explains the rise of the selfie. I think this, this selfie is quite sort of shocking, isn't it? It's like there's something seriously going wrong on an aeroplane, and the guy just like, decides to take a selfie. But it's, it's, it's about authenticity. I was there. This happened to me. And that's what the selfie does. And when you add all of these tendencies that I've been talking about, uh, our quest for social activities, because it makes us happy, the fact that everything is becoming interactive, and our, and our quest for authentic experiences, so leads us sort of inevitably into the field of immersive media, which has all of these qualities. So J. Walter Thompson, I think they're the biggest advertising agency in the world, Last year, their number one trend was immersive experiences. And they're saying entertainment, narratives, and brand experiences will become more immersive and altogether more enveloping in a bid to capture consumers' imagination and attention. It probably explains why there's the phenomenon of, of the secret cinema, which is massively popular in, um, in the UK and across Europe where rather than just going seeing a film in a cinema, um, you buy a ticket and you don't know what the film is. You're told to dress up in a certain way, meet at a certain point. You can see other people dressed in a similar kind of a fashion coming towards you, so that's the kind of the social aspect of it. And then you're taken to a certain location where themes from the film are brought to you in a kind of a theatrical experience. This is the battle for Algiers. And so you then, as a film goer, um, are treated as though you're caught up in the, um, in the um, Algerian war. And then you watch the film, and you get an awful lot more out of that film experience. Um, and it also explains the, the phenomenal rise in theatre terms of promenade performance. Um, so this is Punch Drunk Theatre, now probably one of the, one of the world's top theatre companies. And they, they create non-linear site-specific theatre um, I've been told that there's a similar kind of a production currently happening in Buenos Aires, which I want to go and see. And that's immersive ent entertainment. Um, 
It is also, this is another example of a, of a documentary we had in Sheffield Dockfest last year that wasn't a film that took place in a cinema. It, it was actually something that you experience physically. It's called Door into the Dark. This is a labyrinth. For now, all you need to do is follow the rope. When you're blind, there's no sun, except there's warmth. There's no blue sky, there's no clouds. There are no walls. There, is no, there are no limits to your world. You are a body standing on something in space. Can you feel the hairs on your cheeks? Are they wide awake? Where are you? So, you know, you're in a state of mind where if one of us falls, we're going to die. You find yourself trying to, to cut off from those thoughts. But at the same time, if you allow yourself to know what the situation is, it exerts a kind of pull. What would it be like, you know, to take a fall? I sense that urge, you know, the urge to surrender, to the void. You go into a room and you put on headphones so you can hear that audio track. Um, and you're wearing something across your eyes that cancels almost everything out. So basically all you can see is a tiny amount of light, very little at all. And you hold on to this rope and you walk into the space following instructions on the headphones. And at a certain moment you're told to let go and to carry on walking as you experience um, people's different accounts of getting lost, either losing sight and other experiences of getting lost. And you, so you're navigating almost blind through this space, and you just feel stuff, and you hear stuff. Uh, and that's sort of kind of a new form of a documentary uh, that was then picked up from Sheffield and went to Tribeca this year, where it won the, uh, where it won the top prize for sort of interactive. About four years ago, this is how we used to show interactive work at the Sheffield Dockfest. We didn't really have a picture of, that, of, of how we did it because it was just too boring to show because it was just computer terminals. Right, so, these were, so there were worse computer terminals than this. But we had a few computers set up with uh, interactive projects on them. And that, uh, there's been a bit of an evolution since then, and it looks a bit more like this now, um, where there's sort of discrete spaces, and we create more kind of installation-like uh, um, experiences around each of these documentaries. Um, this game, 1979 Revolution, um, that we sort of made into a kind of an installation here, is going to be available next month, and I highly recommend it to you. It's, it's designed by someone who used to work for Rockstar, so he used to design Grand Theft Auto and Max Payne. Um, and, and what he said was that in 30 years of games being around, um, they only treated a tiny, tiny sliver of human experience, and that made him incredibly frustrated, so he left that company, and now he's, design, he's taking all of the sort of design intelligence he has about creating uh, you know, the most popular games in the world, and he's uniting that with documentary. Um, in this case, to tell a story or to make you a participant in the Iranian Revolution in 1979. So I, I would commend that to you and uh, recommend it when it's available next month. But by showing projects in this way, we had 10,000 visitors to our sort of interactive exhibitions this year at Sheffield Dockfest. Um, so there were 3,000 delegates, so 7,000 of these people were the general public. And the reason I mention that is because a lot of the projects that we show there um, are on the website of the National Film Board of Canada, or The Guardian, 
or, um, or the New York Times, and the majority of these people coming in there would not read those newspapers habitually. But they're coming in and they're engaging with interactive work. And so when I'm talking about, you know, is this stuff niche, I sort of think it doesn't have to be. It's just, it only is at the moment because we haven't yet worked out exactly the right platform distribution method for them. So in the world of immersive technology, we're just undergoing, as I'm, as I'm sure you're aware, another kind of a seismic shift. Um, anybody who was following news from Sundance this year would have sort of come across this kind of a story, how virtual reality ate the Sundance Film Festival. Um, what you can't see under here um, is the subheading. It says, the future of independent film may not be film at all. So all of the noise coming out of Sundance was about virtual reality. A year ago at the Sheffield Doc Fest, we had two virtual reality pieces. So we had Oscar Rabi's Ascent, um, and we had Project Syria, made by Noni de la Peña. Um, and they were both uh, quite, you know, the sort of the, hit, the hits of the festival. This year, we had um, nine different virtual reality projects. Uh, this was uh, Oscar's latest work, All Our World. Um, this is what another one of them looked like. And this is Noni de la Peña's latest project as well. So in the amount, a year ago there were only two documentaries that were made, more or less, uh, on virtual reality. This year we had nine. Next year there's going to be many, many more, more besides. It's, sort of, it's a rapidly emerging uh, and massively exciting market. So the project that won this year's uh, interactive prize was at Sheffield Dockfest was this uh, virtual reality work called Clouds Over Cedra that was actually commissioned by, um, by uh, the United Nations. The United Nations needed a new tool to amplify empathy, which is why UN advisor Gabo Aurora and Verse creator Chris Milk teamed up to create a VR experience from the perspective of 12-year-old Syrian refugee named Citra. Of the millions who have fled the Syrian civil war, over 84,000 have taken up temporary residence in the Satari refugee camp in Jordan. Verse captured Sidra's story with the aid of Verse's proprietary 360-degree camera technology. The footage was then stitched together using Verse tool software and made ready in time for the World Economic Summit in Davos. The film was experienced by over 120 global leaders who all experienced Sidra's refugee camp through her eyes. With demand for touching VR experiences on the rise, the UN has found its empathy machine. So this is using virtual reality for, for um, kind of charity work, essentially to raise consciousness in this case about the plight of Syrian refugees. Uh, first of all, they took it to Davos, as you saw, and they made you know, the world's richest people and the <laughs> most important people um, watch it. Uh, and what they're now going to do is take it out onto the streets um, with, with um, with viewers and say to people, would you like to watch this virtual reality film? And then immediately get people to sort of sign up if they've been moved in order to get more information or to make donations. And that's, that's how they intend to sort of use this in the future. Um, I hope that we're going to be able to show you this if anybody wants to see it, because I've got some kind of cardboard viewers. And, we, and I was just talking to Damian about how we can actually download it onto a phone. So if anybody's interested in that kind of work, you can actually download it on your phone. It takes up about one gigabyte. Um, um, and then just watch it in one of these cobbled views. So I think maybe a bit later on we can actually try and see if it works out there uh, for anyone who's interested. Después, después del break, eh, vamos a poder eh, probarlo en el espacio de colateral. Quien quiera ir, vamos a poder descargar en sus teléfonos la experiencia para poder probarla. Sí. Okay, thank you. And so I guess where we are in terms of virtual reality on this kind of the hype cycle is is we thought it was going to be with us in the 90s. So that's when it came about. And now, um, now, with the advent of Oculus Rift and mobile technology, um, it actually is something. And we're starting to realize what it's good for. So we're probably about here. And we're still learning exactly what is, what, what is intrinsically good about this new medium. Um, but there's a lot to be gained. So this is from TechCrunch, which is a sort of the online sort of technology uh, blog. Um, looking at the projected forecasts of uh, revenue for augmented reality and virtual reality together. So next year, it's already in the billions of dollars, and then it rises massively, massively, massively afterwards. It's just going to be an absolutely 
massive, enormous part of the media industry. And when people like this, who's probably the most trusted person in British television, David Attenborough, is starting to engage with this new medium, you know that that is actually going to be true. Uh, this is from Magic Leap. I don't know if you've sort of come across this. <laughs> I kind of like this. This is sort of explains why they put aug augmented reality and virtual reality together. Um, um, this is their kind of promotional video that shows sort of where that future of mixed reality is going, where virtual reality and augmented reality combine to, uh, to give you virtual experiences in the environment around you. Surprise, surprise, is about shooting things. Uh, I just hope that you guys can come up with a better response to that technology than, than that. But that is the kind of world that I want to live in, I have to say. So then, to address the other kind of part of the question that, that I started with, is like, isn't it hard to get any kind of multi-platform idea funded? Um, this is the crossover market that we set up um, in Sheffield that's now in its second year for funding interactive projects, we sort of realized that already at the DocFest we're bringing together quite a lot of the people necessary to fund projects and that we just needed to add a, a few more that could really then activate interactive projects as well. So we already had film, TV, funds and foundations coming and to that we've added theatre, science, journalism, publishing, third sector, sort of charities and NGOs and arts organizations we found that this kind of a combination means that you can actually get things funded. We're still suffering that problem of walking backwards into the future in that most of the um, normal places you might go to for funding haven't caught up yet with funding this kind of media. Um, I gave um, someone from the Arts Council, which is the primary funder for arts projects in, in the UK, I, I gave them a tour around the interactive exhibitions that we had. Um, and then she was speaking on a panel afterwards, and the first thing that she said was, I've just realized that with all of the things that I've looked at today, there wasn't anything in our funding guidelines that would enable the funding of those projects. So we've had to respond to that by sort of bringing all of these people together so they can fund bits and pieces of those projects together. Um, and last year when we first started it, we were really happy that in the one day of the market, uh, £250,000 worth of investments were made into projects. This year, it was just, um, it was in June this year, um, it, at the one day of that market now, it's 1.5 million pounds, which is nearly two and a half million dollars worth of investments into 26 projects. So that's a six times increase in one year. So there is a demand for this kind of a stuff and you can get it funded. It's just that there's also a lot of competition, which means that you sort of need to check in with people like Power to the Pixel and, and Crossover Labs as well, sort of to help give you that edge, to help you plot those kind of desire lines um, through the media that means that in the end, uh, you can present an argument that, that an audience will find this and an audience will interact with this. 
So I want to finish this now with a kind of a call to arms, because just bearing in mind what the designer of that 1979 revolution game said, it took 30 years for games to start actually uh, sort of becoming smart and treating uh, serious subjects. And I don't want that to happen with new emerging technology. And neither do I really want entrenched sort of media interest to be the people who lead all of that, because we know that that's not going to be particularly interesting. I'd rather it be you, that you quickly learn to understand emerging technology. Um, and also people like Oscar, who will be talking later. Um, so when you're thinking about your projects, think social, think interactive, think immersive. Because really the digital re revolution has barely begun, and it will only partly be televised. <laughs> Thank you. Muchas gracias. Excelente. Gracias.